Coming up on this week's mini episode of the Broken Brain Podcast. If it ran, swam, grew or flew, then eats it, everything else will leave behind. And the other one is real food doesn't contain ingredients. Real food is ingredients. And if you kind of stick to that kind of mentality when you're making dietary choices, you're probably on the right track anyway. Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Food is so much more than just fuel. It's key in helping us live healthier, longer lives. But the question is often when it comes to food, how do we create practical, delicious meals that are a pleasure, an absolute pleasure to eat, but also alleviate a variety of ailments and illnesses? My guests on today's mini episode are Dale Panak, Josh Gitalis, and Dr. Rupi Anjula. And they talk to us about why eating healthy can be so confusing, how to separate studies from fact and fiction, and practical tips for eating your way to better health. My first guest, Dale Pinnock, is a celebrity nutritionist and chef. He has an undergraduate degree in human nutrition, a postgraduate degree in nutritional medicine, and a lifetime in the kitchen. He is the best-selling author of 14 books, a regular face on UK's television, and he's the co-host of the hit show, Eat, Shop, Save on ITV. Let's listen in. I want to start off with something that I read right inside of your bio. Why are we so confused about what to eat as individuals, (laughs) as countries, as nations? Why are we all so confused about something that seems so fundamental, which is what we put in our mouth and eat on a daily basis? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're certainly in trouble. I mean, we are here in the UK and certainly see it in the US as well. I think because... Food and nutrition has weirdly become entwined with popular culture. Somewhere along the way, it actually became something that was driven by trend and then obviously something that fuels a lot of headlines. And as some of the the research was starting to develop, maybe the odd little snippet of information would get into the press and that would cause a sensationalist headline and that would confuse people. And and yeah, all of these things just sort of moulded together. But now we're in a state where no one's really entirely sure what to do or what kind of actions to take. Do you think a big part of it too is like the, the, the media component, you know, I'm reading a article from March 15th, CNN, three or more eggs a week increases your risk of heart disease and early death study says, I mean, something so fundamental that many people have in their diet and you see a headline Mm -hmm. that says you're going to die because you've eaten three eggs or more a week. (laughs) It's sensationalism. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's that kind of, uh, really, I I mean, this isn't the, the job for the everyday person, but really we need to actually go back to the source of the information. Okay, what was that study? Was that a study of that involved following a cohort of 100,000 people for 25 years or was it 10 students and their dog done in some small scale facility using poor methodology we need to actually get back to source and see what the methodology that was employed who was sponsoring it the amount of people that were being studied and what mechanisms were used to actually study them in the first place all of these factors determine whether it's good information but the press don't often care about that they just kind of see this little snippet of information and think oh well that'll sell a few few newspapers so there's the headline that's one of the big problems that we have it's the interpretation of some of the data that's that's kind of dripping out for the person that's out there that's listening and this eggs thing was a was a big conversation. In fact, Dr. Hyman had to go and record an entire podcast just addressing that. You know, for the person that's listening that's confused and is out there, you know, and doesn't know, wasn't taught in school how to read studies, wasn't taught how to dig into it, wasn't taught, how do they even begin to put some level of filter to interpret the information that's that's out there that they're being presented with? Sure. I mean, it's 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 tricky, but obviously, if they're um, <clears throat> very savvy with search engines and things like that, it, it's it's only a couple of searches to get back to source. Just searching the headline, you should have a citation in there. There should be a citation in the article anyway, if it's a decent article, and that can take you back to the source. And then, just usually, you'll find that you'll find an abstract, you'll find like an overview of the study on the first page of the article entry, and that will tell you 
who funded it that will tell you the methodology that was actually employed how many people were being studied and really what you're looking for is the largest number of people possible so you know we've got great sources of information as well we've got things like the um, ndns the national diet and nutrition survey um, in the us you guys have you guys have uh, n haynes these large scale studies that study populations for for very very long periods of time are usually a little more accurate than something that's only only studying a few people because we get that kind of significance of of the data but it's going to be tricky for people it's going to be tricky for people just try and get back to that original article if you can and do some fishing but really you know what i don't think i don't think we even need to worry about that a great deal i think really we can take a bit of a step back from that and just look at the 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 patterns in the way that we eat and i always think there's a few key phrases that sum it up perfectly that guides people perfectly you know if it ran swam grew or flew then eat it everything else leave behind and the other one is real food doesn't contain ingredients. Real food is ingredients. And if you kind of stick to that kind of mentality when you're making dietary choices, you're probably on the right track anyway. My next guest, Josh Gitalis, is a clinical nutritionist and a functional medicine practitioner and runs a Toronto-based private practice with a worldwide client base. He is a recognized expert in integrative healthcare, merging the best of functional medicine and integrative therapeutics. As a leader in his field, Josh has taught clinical nutrition for several natural health colleges and runs the Functional Nutrition Certification Program. He is the first Canadian nutritionist to become an Institute for Functional Medicine Certified Practitioner. In this episode, Josh shares his tips for eating more whole foods, freezing food for later, and tools to help you with meal prep. Let's listen in. How do you help your clients that are having challenges just imagining where are they going to find the time to make food and how they make it a part of their their habit if they haven't had this experience like what are some of the tips that you give to them Mm -hmm. yeah so meal prep that's probably one of the best tips i can i can give because then you're thinking about it before the week comes you know most people don't plan to fail they fail to plan so if we set that two hours of aside on a sunday Uh, It's amazing how much you can accomplish in that period of time. And then you're saving tons of time during the week. Like if you want to have those exact same meals that you've prepped on a Sunday throughout the week, it's going to take you probably double the time. So that's just a practical tip um, that, again, if you plan for it every weekend, it's going to make a huge difference. And the cool thing about these things is you get compounding health interest is what I called call it. So it's, it's a small thing that you do that's going to make a huge difference over weeks, months, years, lifetime. Um, so that, that would be, uh, one tip that we do. And then if people can't, don't have the time, they're going to have to pay someone else who has the time. I mean, those are really the only two options and you have to figure out how to do that. So there's great meal services here in Toronto that some of my clients will use if they have the the funds to do that um, and they don't have the time to meal prep. But again, if they don't have the funds, they have to do the meal prep. And that's the only way really to get good, healthy food throughout the week. I think sometimes we have to even question the idea of how much time things take. You know, when you order Uber Eats and uh-huh. you have them deliver, even from a healthy restaurant, uh, first of all, it's more expensive, of course, than making it at home. Second of all, you know, the fastest you're going to get in is 30 minutes. It takes about 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. Or if you drive to a fast food restaurant, you know, people have to get in their car. They have to drive over. They have to pick up the food. If you're not going to eat there and you're going to eat with your family, you have to bring it back. Or even just forget fast food. There's plenty of people on here that go to places that are semi-healthy, Chipotle, other places, mm-hmm. things like that. How much time do you spend when you're actually like making a meal? You know, how much time are you spending like putting together a meal that's delicious and tastes, you know, tastes great? Is it always like 30 minutes to an hour? Yeah, it really depends. You know, sometimes we have very busy lives uh, as well. Me and my wife, we both have our own businesses. So, you know, sometimes we only have 15 minutes. Sometimes we, we, we don't have much time. I love to cook. My wife likes to cook as well. So when we do have more time, we like to take longer. But we, again, try to plan ahead. We've done, we do a lot of batch cooking. Uh, when we have the time as well, when there's uh, quieter times in our year, uh, we, you know, we will fill the freezers, we'll, we'll, we'll get stuff ready. In fact, before, so we have a 14 month year old boy and before my, uh, before we, we had the boy about, uh, over a year ago, we just like 
totally stacked our freezer because we knew that we weren't going to have time to cook fresh food all the time. So we made, you know, um, awesome tomato sauces and bolognese and, and um, you know, uh, bone broths. Um, and uh, we prepared like veggie burgers and bison burgers and, and froze it all. All the stuff that's so easy to freeze. We did big batches of stuff in the slow cooker. And it took us actually like months upon months to actually get through all that stuff. Um, it's Megan, almost like you spend less time the way you guys make food. You spend less time thinking about food, less time with food sure. on your mind, less time preparing food. It's not like you're obsessed with food and you're thinking about it all day and you're mm -hmm. trying to figure out what to eat, which is what most people do. Yeah. I felt sometimes like I was cheating, right? Like, cause it was too easy. Yeah. We were like, Oh, what are we going to do for dinner? Oh, we have that meal that we did in the freezer. We'll pull that out and we'll add some of these veggies and here we go. And I kind of thought like, that was almost too easy. So <laughs> a little planning can, can go a, a long way. Uh, let's just talk about it because you mentioned it freezing. Mm -hmm. People are very confused about freezing and whether or not it's okay. And to use the freezer, I think for a long time, um, as maybe part of the modern health movement, people have had some sort of association with freezing food as maybe the same thing as frozen food, which is completely different. It's made into a, you know, um, made in a factory, that sort of stuff. So, so give us the lowdown on, on freezing. I've heard it a bunch in, in kind of how you talk about meal prep. Uh, what are the advantages and, um, and is frozen food okay that you're making yourself? Uh, yes, it is totally awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you will lose a small amount of nutrition when you freeze, but not that much, um, especially when you freeze fresh stuff. So we just got 32 pounds of wild blueberries. Wow. And I did all sorts of things with them. I was posting on social media, asking people for suggestions. <laughs> I froze most of those berries because they just looked so amazing. Like they were super small, right? Like I knew they were a good legit batch. Mm. Um, I tried to do it every year. I've been doing it for the past few years. So I froze most of those. And now we have some awesome bags of wild blueberries in our freezer. Uh, I was also making like fruit leather with the blueberries, which is super delicious. You know, I did some fresh stuff. Like we did some muffins. I've done pancakes with it. Um, what else have I done? And anyway, so I, I have those there. Fruits are awesome to do when they're in season. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of the other, you know, sauces and, and burgers and stuff, you're not going to lose any nutrition in the freezing process. Um, they, it freezes really well and again, super easy to pull out. So I'm not too worried about the nutrition lost in, in freezing foods. Um, on a practical level, do you have a whole separate uh, freezer? You know, I've, I've heard a lot of things that get frozen. So do you just use a normal size refrigerator? Do you, uh, do you, uh, cause I think people are, I think sometimes it's like, trying to make the space or actually make sure you have the tools to enable it. So, uh, with a household of three, mm -hmm. um, and, and one of them being a young, a young, uh, boy, uh, what's the practicality of it? Right. So I think the freezer, an extra freezer. So we have a fridge with a freezer, yep. but an extra freezer deep freeze was one of the best investments we've ever made. I mean, that thing has just saved us so many times and, and it's just uh, a key part of our whole nutrition regimen and making sure we have healthy stuff all the time doesn't take up a lot of space. We keep it in the basement. We're in a, in a semi in Toronto, so there's not a lot of space to begin with. Yeah. Um, but a really key item that we've devoted and given a little bit of space in our home to and an investment we're really proud of. Uh, one of the other really key investments, I'm just throwing this out there, Please. that we that we are super happy with in our home was an infrared sauna a number of years ago. Oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and I can imagine in Toronto that goes a long way. Totally. Anywhere it goes a long way. And we'll talk a little bit more about infrared and that sort of thing. But um, I want to talk about a, a couple other hacks because you're great at making these things practical. And, and sometimes there's tools that are out there that make it easier to live this lifestyle. Um, right now on Amazon, it's really popular. Like the, the number top 10 best-selling products, like one of them is like Instapot, mm. right? What do you think of that? Curious about your sort of thoughts. And um, are there any other things that you keep in your household as a family that make it easier to prepare healthy meals on a regular basis? Absolutely, yeah. So I, I think the Instapot's great. We, uh, we use a slow cooker. Uh, we love it. Um, you know, you can do huge amounts at one time. We also um, have a Vitamix, uh, you know, just a high speed blender, which we do like so much stuff with. You can do soups, you know, I do my fruit leather in there. Um, and then of course I dehydrate it afterwards. So those are, I guess, the key appliances that, that we really love. 
um, in terms of sort of beyond the, the basics, fridge, stove, you know, um, burners, things like that. In, in terms of anything above and beyond that, doesn't get used as much, I guess, a food processor, but like our, our Vitamix sort of does the same thing. Yeah, it's kind of like the tool that's helpful for it all. My next guest and good friend, Dr. Rupi Ojula, is an NHS medical doctor and founder of The Doctor's Kitchen, a project to inspire patients about the beauty of food and medicinal effects of eating well. Dr. Rupi is the founder of Culinary Medicine, a nonprofit organization which aims to teach doctors and medical students the foundations of nutrition, as well as teaching them how to cook. He is also the author of two best selling books, The Doctor's Kitchen and his latest book, Eat to Beat Illness. In this episode, Dr. Rupi shares his tips for eating out at restaurants as well as his go to 10 minute meals. Let's listen in. Can you slip that little tip in there, like uh, that tip for ordering at restaurants and, uh, you know, what your approach is? Because you eat out a lot. You have yeah. to go to different conferences. What's your uh, what's your approach when you look at a menu and you're eating out? How do you get the healthiest diet for you? So I uh, subscribe to a plant-focused diet, like I think uh, Dr. Hyman and yourself do as well. Well, we're really focusing on the different colors as much as possible. So, you know, if you find that on the main course there isn't something that you really enjoy, then I go for maybe an appetizer and I just go for the sides. And I also order off the menu too. You know, we live in a society now where the chefs and the restaurants are more than happy to uh, accommodate you right so you can order things off the menu do you have any spinach do you have any mushrooms do you have some tomatoes maybe you know can you can you mix this and this that's how I like to order in restaurants I mean other times I'm gonna have a blowout and I'm gonna have like a, a lovely piece of meat or whatever like good quality steak but at the same time you do have those options and it's just about being a bit more experimental uh, with the side menu <laughs> in fact we had lunch today it's your birthday happy birthday <laughs> yeah, it's funny. you uh <laughs> treated us to lunch on your birthday you grabbed the bill before we could we were literally chasing after you but uh ordering which you had ordered for everybody there literally was a one dish was a plate of asparagus right that was well that was nicely cooked and yeah. another dish was a plate of mushrooms it was like you ordered basically all the sides off the menu mm. and that actually is a very enjoyable experience it's more fun to have that variety and eat a bunch of different things instead of everybody have this just one big plate of this meal which often in the u.s i think the uk does this a little bit too mm. The portions are so nuts mm. and they give you such big portions, even at healthy restaurants sometimes, but really that varietal of eating all these different vegetables and seeing all that color even looks for yeah. a much better table. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think the way we eat, uh, the company in which we eat, as well as the, even the size of our plates as well, this all has an impact on our satiety. So, you know, if we're having small amounts of food and we're sharing it with people, you're actually going to eat slower, you're going to enjoy your meal, and you're actually going to feel fuller quicker with less food as well. And I think, you know, that's that's how we've been designed to eat. You know, from an evolutionary point of view, we didn't each get our own plate. We just ate from the same plate or the same uh, part of the fire or whatever. So, you know, it's a very natural way of eating and it's a very enjoyable way of eating too. Is that a big part of your work, encouraging people to share meals with others? Absolutely. We, uh, for the culinary medicine course, at the end of the cooking, everyone's made their meal and we all sit around a table and we all eat together and we have a discussion about what the clinical case is, what the issues are in general practice or whatever their specialty is, how we actually iterate the conversation around food with specific patients that might not be very receptive to the idea. That is very, very pivotal to not only the learning environment, but actual you know, experiencing what it's like to eat around a table. Because I think we, we usually eat in front of screens or we're in front of our phones and that kind of stuff. And that's a very unnatural state to be in. And the other thing, the stuff I do with the community kitchen as well, we all make the food and we all make an effort to sit around a table and enjoy the food together. So I think it's integral part of the eating experience, but also the health promoting experience of food as well. As well. You know, in Broken Brain, you talked about how you prepare recipes and whole food meals. And you talked about the importance of really... and in 10 minutes or less preparing yeah. these meals and you referenced earlier uh, out of your book what are a couple and maybe we can link them up here in the show notes what are maybe one two or three of your classic kind of go-to 
base recipes. You yeah. know, I see the recipes that you make and you'll vary them. Maybe this time you'll put different spices, but the base might be a go-to base yeah. for you. So what are a, a couple recipes that are like your go-to that you can make in less than 10 minutes? So um, there's one called herby mushrooms. That is one of my favorites. It's just chicken snap peas some frozen peas, sun-dried tomatoes, a little bit of broth in there as well. And that, honestly, I make in about eight, nine minutes. It's super quick. I sometimes make that for breakfast. I might crack an egg in the middle of it too. Um, another one that I, uh, the prep and everything is so quick, but the cooking time is a little bit longer. It's a sweet potato bake with turmeric and lime. And it's literally just prep. You put it into a baking tray and then you just put it in the oven for about 30, 35 minutes. That is probably the least fuss and the most common meal that I'll make at the end of a busy day where I don't really want to cook that much. Um, and uh, there's another one where, oh, it's uh, uh, ginger uh, noodles with uh, soy roasted vegetables. And again, it's, it's very much just putting things onto a plate, making some uh, buckwheat noodles and uh, adding some mushrooms to it as well. There's some delicious recipes. Those there. sound great. <laughs> What you choose to put on your plate is one of the most important health interventions you can make. Food not only affects our likelihood of disease, but it can lengthen our lives, change our mood, and even affect the expression of our DNA. By approaching disease with the holistic perspective of which food is a vital part, we can tackle the root causes of disease and truly live well. Thank you for tuning in to this week's mini episode of the Broken Brain Podcast. I'll see you next week.